right, so another heavy topic. We, uh, we did, what's the Bible say about that? And we've, uh, so far we've talked about drinking, and the Bible has a lot to say about drinking. Uh, we've talked about sexual immorality. The Bible has a lot to say about sexual immorality. So the question is, so what does the Bible say about abortion? Nothing. Nothing. It says not a word about abortion, but I believe that we are a church that stands on the pro-life side of things, and I'm about to tell you why we do. Uh, this video gives you, uh, just from a biological standpoint, why human life is important even in the womb. But what does the Bible say about abortion? Uh, let's start with this concept. It's wrong to murder a person. Would you agree or disagree? Agree. I, I hope you do. I hope that everybody here could agree on that concept, and it's a very biblical concept. It's wrong to murder a person. We can go back to the book of Genesis. We see that Adam and Eve, I mean, their issue was that they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil when they weren't supposed to. But go just one generation. Uh, Cain and Abel were both offering uh, their gifts to God. And Cain's, his gift wasn't that good. Abel's, it was much better. Uh, we don't get any details other than that God looked favorably upon Abel's sacrifice, his gift, but not on Cain's. So Cain was, was guilty. Cain was, was faced with all sorts of jealousy and envy over his brother to the point that he, he desired to take his life and he did so. He murdered his brother. One generation from the creation of the universe and murder is already taking place. And maybe you think, well, we're in Redwood Falls, Minnesota. Well, in nine years, I could tell you the number of murders. We're not on an island and everything is perfect here. It gets even better than that because sometimes we disguise murder. We cover it up with other names, and, and these other names kind of lend themselves to being socially acceptable forms of murder. We can go to Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. It's in your bulletin and your sermon notes there if you want. Uh, it's also on the screen. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For the image of God has God made humankind. In Genesis, the ninth chapter, God is already saying, if you kill somebody, if you take somebody's life, then your life shall be taken from you. I, I want to be perfectly clear about this. I believe that even if you take somebody's life, does not immediately disqualify you from eternal life. If you choose to continue to live in that life, yes, absolutely. You're disqualified from attaining eternal life in heaven. But you can repent. You can turn to God. I believe in that. The Bible is pretty clear in the death punishment. You should still die because you took life. That's my stand. And I think that I have a number of Bible verses that would back me up in saying so. Exodus in chapter 20, verse 13, the Ten Commandments. It doesn't get much more clear than this. You shall not murder. If you want to know if you should take somebody's life, no, you shall not murder. One of only ten things that were given to the, the Israelites initially. Don't do it. Uh, we come back to uh, the New Testament. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 21, as the acts of the sinful nature, there are a number of things listed. Among them, murder. Murder. The hate of another individual is an act of the sinful nature. But we are made new in Christ. We have a new image. We're supposed to bear the fruit of the Spirit, of which none of those are murder. Quite the opposite. Love. Love is, is the opposite of hate, and hate is what leads to murder. You hate somebody so much that you're willing to end their life. You're so jealous, so guilty. Really, it amounts to being a cover-up. Think of Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain was trying to do anything he could to cover up his own guilt and shame. He didn't want to feel those feelings, so if I just eliminate my brother, hey, I'm, I'm back to being number one. How many times do, does somebody get ahead of us in life and we feel like we just need to, to maybe pull them back a little bit so that we can feel better about ourselves? And maybe we do that through gossip. Maybe we do that through slander. Maybe we do that through hate speech. And we talk negatively about other people. In the New Testament, Jesus is pretty clear about saying if you even look on someone with hate, you're, you're guilty of murder in your own heart. That's pretty steep. 
Romans chapter 13, verse 9 is on, your, on the screen, but I want to share with you just a little bit more of that. Uh, Romans in chapter 13, starting in verse 8. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. It's pretty clear. We as believers in Christ need to love. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. All of the Old Testament law, all of the things that are given in the New Testament law, they're summarized in love. We love other people. We care for other people. We sacrifice ourselves for the benefit of other people. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder you shall not steal, you shall not cover, and whatever other commands there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to the neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love. And so we have to ask ourselves, when it comes to the topic of abortion and, and killing a baby in the womb, is that love? Is that expressing a selfless desire for life? or a selfish desire to cover up, many times, guilt and shame. Uh, many times, added responsibility. There are numerous reasons why some people would get abortions. But just to tie this in, uh, 1 John chapter 3, 11 through 18. And we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, camping out on this verse. So if you want to find it in the, in the pew Bible around you, if you brought your own Bible, you might want to go to 1 John in chapter 3, starting with verse 11. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. You should love one another. Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. Hey, get that. The reason that Cain hated his brother Abel was because he was righteous and his own actions were evil. If you are righteous, if you're living a right life before God, those who are not living a right life are going to do what they can to try to pull you down and hold you back, keep you from advancing the gospel message, keep you from advancing in your identity in Christ. They're going to try to, to tie you down to your old life, to the old choices, to the old consequences, to your old friends, and they're going to say you're no good, you don't deserve it, you can't attain this. They're going to do what they can to pull you back. They may not kill you, but they'll say an awful lot of stuff and do an awful lot of stuff to hurt you and to make you feel unworthy. Don't be, ashamed, or don't, don't be surprised if the world hates you because of your righteousness. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. So how can you know if somebody is really in Christ? How can you, you understand if they're really a new creation? If, if the old lifestyle is gone and the new has come? It's simple. Do they love? Do they love other people? Do they love unconditionally? Do they love sacrificially? Are they willing to give everything for the benefit of someone else? It's a test and it's a good test. So from the beginning, murder's been around from the beginning. Cain and Abel, around from the beginning. How do we combat that? We love one another. We're a church that continues to go back to the great command in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 31. We love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we love our neighbor as ourself. All of the commands are summarized in that. This passage in Romans that we just read it summarizes it again. All of these commands, everything. Do not murder. Do not steal. It's all wrapped up in love for one another. Love our neighbor as ourselves. So how do we know if someone has passed from death to life? It's in the way that they love. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. 
just a, a sidebar here. You know, if you ever get to a, a position where you're thinking, you know what, I am better than some of these other people who have made this choice, who have went down this road, think to yourselves, how many times have I said of someone else, I hate them? How many times have your actions dictated those very thoughts? I hate them, I don't like them, I can't stand them, I don't want to be around them, I wish the worst upon them. Maybe you'll go as far as to say, God damn them. That would be a horrible way to live a life. But think, I, I go back to when I was a kid, how many times I, I'd say, uh, out of innocence even, I hate you. I hate you. I don't want any part of you. The Bible's pretty clear they're on the same level. There's grace for you, and there's grace for those who have walked this path as well. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. We just talked about communion. We just celebrated a time in which the Savior of the world gave up everything in heaven to walk the road before us on earth and to give his life willingly so that we can experience the grace of God. How do we know what love is? He laid down his life. And this is the call. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. I can't speak to, you know, if, if a mother is lying in the hospital bed and her life is about to be taken from her, that it's okay or not okay to abort the baby. But I can say this. I can't imagine any mother willingly saying, okay. Most any mother that I've come into contact would say, you know what, if my life, if it costs me my life to have this baby, then I, I will give my life for this child. Most any mother. I, I think that there's, there's a natural instinct of protection and preservation that goes along with that. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need and has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear, dear children, let us love not with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Love. I'm going to come back to this passage here at the end, and I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you a pathway to peace that I think is necessary. It's essential to go along with this message. But before we do so, I want to go on to uh, the idea of the unborn is a person. We know that, that murdering a person is wrong. The Bible is clear about that. I think the Bible is also pretty clear about that the unborn is a person. There is something about that. We could go to Luke in chapter 1 and verse 41 and see that when, when Mary, the mother of Jesus, came to visit Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, whenever Mary entered in, the, the baby inside of Elizabeth's womb leapt for joy. There was, there was movement. There was action. This baby who was not yet born was already moving. He was alive. Matthew in chapter 1, verse 20. We can see the story of Jesus. In Matthew 1, verse 20, the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, and he said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. This is at the, the idea of conception. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. At the, the moment of conception, at, at the, the concept here of this baby being inside the womb of Mary is this concept of life. This baby has already started to begin its life on earth. There is signs of life. Uh, we can go on to uh, Matthew, or excuse me, we can go on to Exodus in chapter 21, back to the Old Testament. Uh, Exodus is, uh, is pretty clear on taking a life of someone who takes a life, but it also speaks specifically here of a baby. If people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, 
but there is no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. There's a protection order for the unborn baby. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life. If there is serious injury, you are to take life for life. The same punishment for those who have committed murder is passed on to those who kill a baby while it's still in the womb. We can go on again to the New Testament. Or excuse me, rather, uh, let's go to Jeremiah first. And Jeremiah is probably one of the most quoted uh, passages of Scripture when it comes to pro-life. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Before Jeremiah was born, God appointed him. God knew him. Isaiah in chapter 49 before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. There was life. It was already conceived. It was already started and going towards what God had predestined it and called it towards in both the case of Isaiah and Jeremiah. So here's how we connect the dots. Is abortion wrong? What does the Bible say about abortion? It says nothing about abortion, but it says murder is wrong. It's wrong to kill a person. So the biggest question is, is that baby in the womb, is, is that life? Is, is that a child? And at what point does it become a child? Well, I think the Bible is pretty clear in a number of passages that we've talked about that life is actually taking place inside of the womb. The baby is growing Things are happening. The video you saw before, pictures of this baby, even at a very early state, look like a baby. It's moving like a baby. It's acting and expressing different feelings. So it's wrong. Abortion is wrong. Romans in chapter 1, uh, same passage we kind of referred to a little bit in regards to sexual immorality. The concept here in verse 22 of Romans chapter 1 is, Although they claim to be wise, they have become fools and have exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Basically, we as humans have exchanged God, the creator of the universe, and we've began to worship all these created things. We do it all the time. Maybe you don't have a, a carved image sitting up on your mantle. Or maybe you do. Maybe it was manufactured someplace in China. But it's man-made. And you're worshiping it. And you're bowing down. And it has more clout. It has more power than the creator of the universe. You spend more time worshiping that than you do in your Bible and praying to God. What is happening in, in Hollywood, what, what the, the stars are doing maybe means more to you than what God has said is right or wrong. And he says, Therefore, God gave them over to the sinful desires of their heart. Going down to verse 28, Furthermore, just as they did not know it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so that they would do what ought not to be done. One of the punishments that God will allow us to endure is the consequences of our, our actions. He will allow a natural course to take place. If you want to desire to worship the created things instead of the creator of the universe, if you want to listen to popular or public opinion over that of the God of the universe, then he'll allow you to be turned over to this depraved mind. And let me tell you what will happen in verse 29. And they will become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. And sometimes we change the name to things like abortion. And we pretend that it's okay. I can't speak specifically to the topic of abortion, but there's one among us who can. Some of you know I work or I volunteer over at Choices Pregnancy. Um, as part of my training to become a counselor, I had the opportunity to 
go to a post-abortive retreat weekend. Um, it was amazing. Not only, I expected a bunch of young girls there, and instead there were women, the youngest I think were, was in her 30s, and the oldest in her 60s. Um, there were husbands, there were boyfriends that came to, the boyfriend came to stand up with and support his girlfriend. The husband belonged to, the husband and wife were, had been girlfriend and boyfriend in high school. They had gotten pregnant, had an abortion, it broke them up. They went their separate ways and then seven years later they got back together, got married and have a beautiful family. It doesn't affect just women, it affects men too. It affects the fathers of these children. Back in 1973 when we legalized abortion, we legalized murder. I think it's hurt the country tremendously. The retreat was a healing thing. We went through exercises that were connected with Bible verses. People have come up here and they've spoken about addiction, they've spoken about drinking. That's something they have overcome. Abortion is something you never overcome. It might not affect you immediately, and most of the time it doesn't. It will affect your actions immediately. It will affect what you feel within the first couple of months but then you tend to hide it. It disappears. You try to push it away, and then it will come back about 10 years later, and it will haunt you, it will stay with you, you will think about it all the time. Most of the people, the young people that go through abortion, are just using it as a form of birth control. It isn't. They don't realize how it will affect their lives. They don't realize that this isn't something that, okay, it's over now, we can go back to the way things were. That isn't the way it happens. The exercises we went through at the retreat healed us and affected everybody in a way that, unless you experience it, cannot be shared. Um, you have basically murdered somebody. You have murdered your baby. Whether it's as a form of birth control, whether it is because somebody asked you to do, forced you to do it, or because you were young and you couldn't take care of it, there are other options. There is adoption. There is raising the child on your own. There are so many so many assistance programs now that can help you raise your children if you care to if you care to be the parent if you don't if you would like to place your child up for adoption there are op open adoptions where you still have a connection with your child some children who are pregnant and cannot raise their their child on their own that would be the best way to handle it but if you're looking at it for strictly a birth control method, it is just not what you expect it to be. When you murder your child, it's something that will stay with you whether you think it is, think it will or not. Murder, you can be forgiven for. Moses was a murderer, David was a murderer, and God looked on favor to them. So it is something you can get by, but unless you go through some kind of a healing process, you will not. One of the exercises at this retreat was an exercise where you named your child. You prayed, you found out what sex your child was, you named your child. It, we had uh, the last day was a memorial service. You got to, you had a rose, you had a baby doll, you put it in a cradle, 
reading about this beforehand, it was like, whoa, this is pretty heavy. <laughs> it was such a freeing experience that I would recommend anybody who has gone through one to seek some kind of a healing retreat. They've got different programs, they've got Bible studies, they've got all kinds of things available. Um, in my case, I was married. Um, most of you don't know, I, I had two marriages. My first marriage was right after college. It was our first year of marriage. I was, I had moved to Vermont. I was living on unemployment. My husband was not working. We got pregnant and he says, he basically convinced me to give up our baby because we couldn't afford to have any children at that point. Um, that did end our marriage. Um, I think he's still paying the price for it. He's remarried a number of times and has never has never come to church. He's he has never sought forgiveness. The relationship he's in now is not good. He has no connection with our daughter and he comes home at night, drinks himself to sleep so he doesn't have to put up with his wife. And some of the, there are so many after effects of abortion on both the mother and the father that you don't recognize unless you actually look at a sheet of paper that lists all the different things that can happen to you. All the side effects, all the results of what you're feeling in your heart. One of the women, one of the exercises was to write a letter at who you were still mad at because of the abortion. And one of the women wrote a letter that we all agreed on and was wonderful and I'd like to share it with you. Dear Abortion Clinic, why? Why do you preach a false message of choice to women and men? Why do you claim there is empowerment for women in choosing death for their unborn children? Why do you not warn women who are contemplating the awful choice of abortion about what it will do to them days, weeks, months, and years down the road? Abortion is not a solution for unplanned pregnancy. It's a trap that leads to a snowball of evil emotions and tumultuous guilt. Why didn't you warn me that for 20 years I would carry this secret and all the guilt, shame, regret, and self-hatred that go along with my choice? While I no longer choose to carry this burden, no longer will I carry this guilt. I have asked for forgiveness and have been forgiven through the blood of my precious Jesus. No longer will I carry the burden of the choice I made 20 years ago. I have given it over to my beloved Savior and stand at the foot of the cross, clinging to his forgiveness, grabbing onto it with both hands. He is knitting my broken heart back together. This is the choice I now make, to stop hating myself and allow him to forgive me fully. His grace and sacrifice on that cross are more than sufficient for me. Signed, forgiven, and set free in Minnesota. It's... You don't understand what feelings of guilt and shame you go through. I carried mine for 28 years. And it's, it's something you don't just get past. It's very difficult. And it's life changing. My son is named Gabriel, and I look forward to seeing him in heaven when I get there. Thank you. We have stories all around us. Don't be ashamed of sharing yours. Our God is a God of forgiveness, a God of healing, a God of second chances. 
maybe there is some choice that you've made that has led you to a life of guilt and shame. Maybe you're beating yourself up and nobody else even knows that, that you're just destroying yourself from the inside out. Going back to 1 John in chapter 3, starting with verse 19. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in His presence. Setting your hearts at rest, being at peace, getting past the guilt and the shame. This is how. If, your heart, if our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and He knows everything. Maybe you're trying to hide what you've done. God already knows. He's greater than your hearts that are condemning you. He's, he's greater than the guilt and the shame. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and He knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from Him anything we ask because we keep His commands and do what pleases Him. How do you get a clean conscience? How do you get a, a clean heart? How do you get past the conviction, the guilt, and the shame? You come clean before God. And you allow Jesus Christ and the blood of His sacrifice to cover you completely and totally. And this is His command. Get this. Three steps to peace. This is His command. To believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. Step one. Do you believe in the name of Jesus Christ? Is He the Savior of the universe? Is He the one true Son of God? Is He the Savior of your soul? Secondly, to love one another as He commands us. To love one another as He commands us. All of the law is summed up in this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love. They will know we're Christians by our love. We cherish the lives that are around us instead of ridiculing them and talking down about them and acting in hate. We love other people. And third, The one who keeps God's commands lives in Him. And He in them. We believe in Jesus Christ. And we begin to live for Jesus Christ. As we love on other people. Three steps to peace. Believe, love, and live in obedience to God's commands. And this is how we will know that He lives in us. We know it by the Spirit that He gives us. The Spirit of God is bigger than all of the guilt and shame. And He promises for those of us who believe in Him and are baptized, immersed into Christ and His name, that His Spirit will indwell us and give us peace that surpasses all understanding.